The Gormenghast Trilogy by Mervyn Peake Book One Titus Groan Fever White and cool as was the light of the north window, Kedda could tell that the sun was alone in the sky and that the winter day was cloudless and temperate. She could not tell how late it was, nor whether it was morning or evening. The old man brought a bowl of soup to her bedside. She wished to speak to him, but not yet, for the spell of silence was still so richly about her and so eloquent that she knew that with him there was no need to say anything at all. Her floating body felt strangely clear and sweet, lying as though it were a lily of pain. She lay now holding the carvings at her side, her fingers spread over their smooth wooden contours, while she experienced the slow ebbing of fatigue from her limbs. Minute after minute passed, the steady light filling the room with whiteness. Every now and again she would raise herself and dip the earthenware spoon into the pottage, and, as she drank, her strength came back in little thick leaps. When she had at last emptied the bowl, she turned over upon her side, and a tingling of strength rose in her with every moment that passed. Again she was conscious of the cleanness of her body. For some time the effort was too great to be made, but when at last she pulled away the blankets, she found that she was washed free of all the dust of her last days of wandering. She was unstained and there was no trace of the nightmare upon her, only the sweet bruises, the long threads where thorns had torn her. She tried to stand and nearly fell, but drawing in a deep breath steadied herself and moved slowly to the window. Before her was a clearing where greyish grass grew thickly, the shadow of a tree falling across it. Half in this shadow and half out of it a white goat was standing, and moving its sensitive narrow head side to side. A little beyond, to the left, was a mouth of a well. The clearing ended where a derelict stone building, roofless and black with spreading moss, held back a grove of leafless elms, where a murmuration of starlings was gathered. Beyond this grove, Kedda could catch a glimpse of a stony field, and beyond this field a forest climbing to a rounded summit of boulders, She turned her eyes again. There stood the white goat. It had moved out of the shadow and was like an exquisite toy, so white it was, with such curls of hair, such a beard of snow, such horns, such great and yellow eyes. Kedder stood for a long while gazing upon the scene, and although she saw with perfect clarity the roofless house, the pine shadow, the hillocks, the trellis work vine, Yet these were no part of her immediate consciousness, but figments of the half-dream languor of her awakening. More real to her was the bird's song at her breast, defying the memory of her lovers and the weight of her womb. The age that was her heritage and the inexorable fate of the dwellers had already begun to ravage her head, a despoliation which had begun before the birth of her first little child, who was buried beyond the great wall, and her face had now lost all but the shadow of her beauty. Kedda left the window, and taking a blanket, wrapped it about her, and then opened the door of the room. She found herself facing another, of roughly the same size, but with a great table monopolising the centre of the floor, a table with a dark red cloth drawn across it. Beyond the table the earth descended by three steps, and in the further and lower portion of the floor were the old man's garden tools, flower pots, and pieces of painted and unpainted wood. The room was empty, and Kedda passed slowly through a doorway into the clearing of sunlight. The white goat watched her as she approached and took a few slender legged steps towards her, lifting its head high into the air. She moved onwards and became conscious of the sound of water. 
The sun was about halfway between the zenith and the horizon, but Kedder could not at first tell whether it was morning or afternoon, for there was no way of knowing whether the sun was climbing through the high east or sinking in the high west. All was stillness. The sun seemed to be fixed forever, as though it were a disk of yellow paper pasted against the pale blue wintry sky. She went forward slowly through the unknown time of day towards the sound of water. She passed the long roofless building on her left and for a moment was chilled by the shadow it cast. Descending a steep bank of ferns she came across the brook almost immediately. It ran between dark leafless brambles. A little to Kedda's left, where she stood among the thorny bushes at the water's edge, there was a crossing of boulders, old and smooth and hollowed into shallow basins by the passage of what must have been centuries of footfall. Beyond the ford, a grey mare drank from the stream. Her mane fell over her eyes and floated on the surface of the water as she drank. Beyond the grey mare stood another of dappled skin, and beyond the dappled mare, at a point where the brook changed direction and bore to the right under a wall of evergreens, was a third, a horse whose coat was like black velvet. The three were quite still and absorbed, their manes trailing the water, their legs knee-deep in the sounding stream. Kedda knew that if she walked a little way along the bank to her left until she gained a view of the next reach of the river, she would see the drinking horses one after another receding across the flats, each one an echo of the one before it. Echoes of changing colour, but all knee-deep in water, all with their hanging manes, their drinking throats. Suddenly she began to feel cold. The horses all lifted their heads and stared at her. The stream seemed to stand still, and then she heard herself talking. Kedder, she was saying. Your life is over. Your lovers have died. Your child and her father are buried. And you also are dead. Only your bird sings on. What is the bright bird saying? That all is complete? Beauty will die away suddenly and at any time. At any time now, from sky and earth and limb and eye and breast and the strength of men and the seed and the sap and the bud, and the foam, and the flower. All will crumble for you, Kedda, for all is over. Only the child to be born, and then you will know what to do. She stood upon the boulders of the ford and saw below her the image of her face in the clear water. It had become very old. The scourge of the dwellers had descended. Only the eyes, like the eyes of a gazelle, defied the bane which now gave to her face the quality of a ruin. She stared, and then she put her hands below her heart, for the bird was crying, crying with joy. It is over, screamed the beaked voice. It is only for the child that you are waiting. All else fulfilled, and then there is no longer any need. Kedda lifted her head and her eyes opened to the sky where a kestrel hung. Her heart beat and beat, and the air thickened until the darkness muffled her eyes, while the gay cry of the bird went on and on. It is over! It is over! It is over! The sky cleared before her. Beside her stood the brown father. When she turned to him, he raised his head and then led her back to the cabin, where she lay exhausted upon her bed. The sun and moon had forced themselves behind her eyes and filled her head. A crowd of images circled about them. The cactus trees of the mud dwellings revolved around the towers of Gormengast, which swam about the moon. Heads ran forward towards her, starting as mere pinpoints on an infinitely far horizon, enlarging unbearably as they approached. They burst over her face, her dead husband's face, Mrs. Slags and Fuchsias, Bragons, Flays, the Countesses, Rantles and the Doctors, with his devouring smile. Something was being put into her mouth. It was the lip of a cup. She was being told to drink. 
Oh, father, she cried. He pressed her gently back against the pillow. There is a bird crying, she said. What does it cry? said the old man. It cries with joy for me. It is happy for me. For soon it will all be over, when I am light again. And I can do it, O oh father, when I am light again. What is it you will do? Kedda stared at the reeds above her. That is what shall happen, she murmured. With a rope, or with deep water, or a blade, or with a blade.